so last but not at all least, um, we have Andy Coster. Andy Coster will speak to us on the past and present roles of the Children's Aid Society in the investigation, assessment, and treatment of child sexual abuse. Um, Andy has over 50 years of experience. From personal experience sitting and talking to Andy, he is a wealth of information. Um, he served as the executive director of the Brandt Family and Children's Service in Ontario for many, many years. He's authored and co-authored numerous articles. He's involved in teaching social work students at both the bachelor and master's level. Um, and he's uh, served as an expert in, in cases before and has been involved with the government in terms of um, uh, the government reports on child deaths in, in care. So we welcome Andy uh, to provide everyone some insight into the Children's Aid Society. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, I have to tell you I'm very glad that I came here today. I've heard so many wonderful things uh, from an emotional level and, uh, and here I am, last of the day, and uh, I'm hoping we're not going to bore you with uh, the context of uh, sexual abuse as it relates to children's aid societies, but I'm really hoping that what I'm trying to offer is that if I can give you the context of what agencies were supposed to know and what guidance they had, it may help you in understanding, uh, you know, the situation, you know, in in uh, in your lives, right, at certain uh, stages. So um, the um, the information. Oh, I can't quite see the uh, board from here. So I'll stand here. Thank you. So uh, the slides uh, they're going to show you. Um, they represent uh, my own experience. Um, I started in 1971 uh, in a uh, receiving center in Hamilton, uh, part of the Hamilton CAS, and a year later had my first caseload. Um, and I'm one of those people that uh, on, on the team that I was on, I was a real uh, collector of articles and I always made sure I was the last person in the group to receive the article, then I put it in my bottom desk, uh, bottom drawer of my desk. and. Uh, over the years really accumulated a whole bunch of material which I can now look back on and get a real understanding of what things were like. I in addition to that, um, I've also had the opportunity to go through uh, the Ontario archives to understand uh, what was the government's role, what was, um, what did uh, various children's aid societies also um, have in terms of procedures. Uh, because when I first started to do work with lawsuits, I realized there wasn't a lot of material um, you know, on what children's aides were supposed to do, and especially in regard to sexual abuse. And uh, the, the, the bottom line is that uh, there wasn't much guidance. Um, individual agencies could have different cultures, and some were more progressive in regard to sexual abuse investigation and assessment and treatment than others. Um, but uh, there, there really wasn't that uh, central guidance until the 1980s, actually, by government when they had the first training program. Um, that they authorized uh, that was specific to sexual abuse. And uh, so, uh, first of all, um, in the uh, 19, um, the, the first uh, act that I'll refer back to was uh, the one from uh, 1954 that went to 1965. And they didn't uh, identify sexual abuse specifically. They just talked about neglect. Um, so, and then a, a children's aid society would have to investigate an incident of neglect and make a report within 30 days. And that there really wasn't too much uh, else in regards to not just sexual abuse, but physical abuse and other things. And uh, so, um, um, allegations against foster parents, uh, they weren't really thought about in the 60s. Uh, foster parents were seen as people that out of the goodness of their heart, and many, many were in that situation of out of the goodness of their heart, but uh, th of course they wouldn't uh, harm kids. So they, they were seen as upstanding people of, commu of the community. And um, the uh, home studies that were done on them did have a series of things that they had to look at back then, but there wasn't necessarily police record checks. Uh, and it was more important to get a, an authorization from your local pastor or from neighbors 
um, uh, when, when they were doing the home studies, but there were requirements to have uh, home studies completed. Um, too often in the 60s, and I know this from doing some of the um, various um, reports, but also when I um, looked at um, some of the past uh, cases um, that I had myself, because uh, I had the microfiche and the paper files from the 60s, uh, often um, kids weren't believed when they did come forward. The uh, alternative reasons were, uh, um, were surmised. And I know the situations actually where um, a child, uh, maybe a teenage girl would come in and she'd uh, accuse, say, her father and um, th she might be termed to be, well, uh, really uh, uh, out of control and, uh, and perhaps uh, needed to go to training school. I mean, that, that's an extreme example. But it wasn't like automatically people would say, hmm, she must be telling the truth or at least uh, there's a great chance she's telling the truth and let's go further. And investigations uh, just didn't have a great deal of depth. Uh, sometimes they were directly referred to the police and uh, back then, as I'll explain a bit later, there had to be some kind of um, other evidence, physical evidence. Uh, you couldn't just take, the, uh, take at that point the hearsay evidence uh, of, a, of a child. There had to be more evidence. And, uh, and, um, so a lot of the uh, allegations uh, were not uh, brought forward in a criminal manner. And in the Children's Aid Society, if the police didn't investigate and didn't charge, then that meant, uh, well, it probably didn't happen. So, um, you know, that was, that was uh, the kinds of things that were, hap were happening then. There were no mandated policies and procedures uh, for investigation from the ministry. Uh, at all, and uh, so uh, a lot of the procedures that agencies did have were the guidance of the Child Welfare League of America. Um, they, uh, they were really at the forefront and had uh, just about every category from foster care to ch child care um, to uh, investigation, uh, counseling. They were all um, put into uh, procedural formats, and Ontario in particular, and I think other places in Canada too, uh, copied those Child Welfare League of America um, procedures or uh, guidance. And I know that some agencies actually adapted them and personalized them, like I think Toronto and Toronto Catholic and other agencies also had their own versions. Um, in the 1960s, and I want to give you a bit of an example of how, um, I won't say, uh, uh, yeah, the word is backward. Uh, agencies uh, were in regard to the various kinds of abuse. It was only in the 1960s that there was uh, any particular knowledge of uh, different types of physical abuse. And uh, one of the uh, things that really uh, helped move things forward was the battered child syndrome by Dr. Henry Kemp, an American pediatrician. Um, and two years later, uh, Dr. Cottenham, who was the uh, chief coroner of Ontario, put out a, put out a paper uh, that was given to Children's Aids uh, to look for young babies who might be uh, abused and, and battered uh, because a parent was losing control because uh, of you know emotional buildup and things. But that was that was one of the first things that was given specifically to Children's Aid regarding things to look for. And uh, in the Ch Child Welfare Act of 1965, definition of caregiver, uh, it's important too because it defined that it wasn't just a parent that you would actually um, investigate if you got an allegation, but also people who had um, the authority over a child. So that could be a babysitter, teacher, uh, uh, other people. But other than that, um, um, outside uh, sexual um, assaults uh, by a person in the community were normally handled by the police. And then uh, in the 1970s, the physical uh, abuse uh, um, skills, uh, I think, improved in children's aid societies. This, the same hen, uh, Kemp uh, also had um, a, a number of books. Um, and uh, at that point, it was like Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, where Kemp was, was kind of the leading edge for all new information coming out. Uh, but this was only really about physical abuse. In the late 70s, things started to change. And I can remember as a worker, all of a sudden, uh, people started to discuss um, sexual abuse, and especially uh, sexual abuse of uh, girls. Uh, a part of that uh, we know came from uh, the rise of the, uh, the women's movement. Uh, there was a number of, um, just a number of articles that came out uh, 
and for the first time we started to get training, um, not formalized training, but uh, agencies would get uh, speakers in. Uh, and I remember uh, people like uh, Susan Segroy, who some of you may know, she she wrote a handbook on child sexual abuse. Uh, Nicholas Groth uh, was another one that was in the standard libraries of children's aids. Uh, Nicholas Groth um, really was the first person who uh, tried to differentiate between different types of sexual offenders. Uh, one group that he termed to be regressed, those are the people that under pressure perhaps uh, reverted to attraction towards uh, children, uh, but normally speaking would have a, uh, adult desires. And the other group that he had were uh, uh, pedophilic. So he was the first time, it was the first time there was a typology uh, actually presented to children's aid societies. Um, I sh uh, third bullet point there, CAS workers did not usually consider women or mothers capable of committing sexual abuse without being forced to do so by an uh, abusive partner or spouse. I mean, when we look back, I think people were surprised, you know, with Hamolka, you know, um, you know, 20, 20 years later, you know, in regard to her sister. But uh, I can tell you that uh, it just uh, wasn't really in the mindset of uh, workers. And of course, you know, the uh, abuse by men a lot more uh, uh, prevalent. Um, the, another thing to realize is historical incidents of abuse could not be presented uh, in family court at this time. Um, it was only until the, uh, and I, I remember it um, as a Toronto case in the late 70s, and you would, as lawyers, you'd probably know more than I do on that one, but uh, there was um, a case where, uh, I think it was the Toronto CAS wanted to bring a child into care, and um, um, based on the fact that uh, grandparents had uh, mistreated a child in the past, and uh, the, a ruling was made that the past evidence could be brought in, and that was a really seen as a precedent. So for the first time, um, the um, past history uh, of concern could actually be brought into the present. But it's, uh, when, when you look at uh, CAS files from the 70s and before that, you see opens and closings, opens and closings. And uh, today, hopefully, we wouldn't uh, close some of the cases because we'd look at accumulated risk. But back then, you had to judge each case by what you had in front of you yeah, because uh, it wasn't seen as relevant to, to, to bring in the past. You weren't really allowed to, uh, to do that. Um, but that didn't mean to say that workers shouldn't read the past files. <laughs> okay. And I should also say, too, that even though sexual abuse was not emphasized in government training uh, and wasn't really, um, uh, not too much was known about it, it was uh, expected that if a children's aid society, even from the 50s and 60s, got an allegation that a child was being sexually abused, they had to investigate that. So there was no excuse not to. It's just that what they did after the fact uh, sort of uh, makes us shake our heads today. I also uh, mentioned that domestic violence was not something that we could bring a, a, a child to, uh, to court on because you had to prove that the domestic violence itself had had a physical effect on the child. It was very difficult for workers as well to look at the emotional uh, uh, effect on the, on the kids because uh, we were not regarded as being able to give an opinion on uh, the emotions. Uh, that had to be from a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So I know on a number of occasions that prevented uh, cases uh, also being uh, brought into court. Whoops, I go back here. Uh, coordination with police was inconsistent. Some CAS workers deferred all investigations to the police since they mistakenly thought that uh, determining criminality, I said proceeding, but superseded as well uh, their child protection mandate. So there's lots of situations where I know that uh, agencies actually close cases if the, uh, if the police did not charge. And uh, even back then, though, they had an obligation under the, uh, under the Act uh, to uh, make it their own determination of a child in need of protection, which would be at a le lower level of proof uh, to the, you know, at least the civil law level of proof. But lots of times uh, that wasn't done, and, uh, and that, was, that was wrong. Um, I think I mentioned the next one about uh, corroborating evidence. Um, 
disclosure of a child was uh, considered hearsay. In the early 1970s, um, I think I gone backwards there. Uh, with the police too, there was no not a consistent degree of information sharing. Um, sometimes there was a reluctance to share police evidence unless a trusting interpersonal relationship existed between the two. There, there were no protocols in the 70s, and it was only until the mid 80s. Uh, when that first happened, and Toronto was one of the first areas where they had police protocols uh, with the Metropolitan um, um, Sexual Abuse uh, Committee. And uh, so uh, that was a real difficulty because in some cases, uh, children's aid societies got along with their local police, but in other areas they didn't. And uh, it was a matter of uh, degree of trust being established uh, between individuals rather than a systemic response. And so uh, you could have a worker that uh, appeared to be very um, helpful to police, and they might have a much better relationship, and m uh, more information might be shared on the QT. Um, but other than that, sometimes you had a criminal investigation, but the police wouldn't share that information, and uh, sometimes vice versa. There were no protocols uh, f as to who would interview the child, and there were no protocols uh, uh, in regard to how people would interview. So, you know, you could have really bad interviews being done, uh, which really weren't helpful. Uh, and, uh, uh, but sometimes you had skilled people too that w without using protocols would be able to get uh, children to disclose. Sometimes police were not automatically called by the CAS back then if there was an allegation of sexual abuse. Uh, Sometimes uh, when, they, when they called the police, uh, the police would also say, well, see if you can find out more information before we decide to intervene. You know, and that wouldn't happen today. There would be a lot more coordination and deciding who's going to do what and when. So I've mentioned that mid-'80s was the first time we really started to have protocols. One of the things that really changed child welfare, and I can't emphasize it enough, was the um, Pope and Inquiry. Uh, a child died in Sarnia in, in uh, I think it was 1976, and two years later there was an inquiry, uh, you know, headed by a judge. And four years uh, um, of testimony, um, ending in 82, uh, meant that for the first time that the uh, ministry uh, had to have a series of steps that had to be taken for every single <coughs> abuse investigation, physical and sexual and emotional. Before that, there was no actual assigned number of steps. So for the first time, uh, a child had to be seen, say, within 24 hours. Other children in the family had to be seen. Um, you know, the child had to be interviewed by themselves. Parents had to be seen. Uh, medical, uh, if required, was also on that list. So there was a required step by step by step. So some of you, as lawyers, uh, if your case is after about 1981, uh, and there was abuse, you should be able to see um, uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, form which uh, required uh, workers to fill it out uh, and to make, at the end of it, some kind of decision as to what they were dealing with. Another thing that uh, happened about the same time, and the first one I'm familiar with was 1978, and that's a risk assessment. Uh, there was a person, a professor at McMaster called Cyril Greenland. He had the first um, series of um, characteristics that you might look for to decide whether a child was being mistreated. Before that time, there weren't any aids to help workers to be able to you know, make some kind of um, decisions or, gu or to guide them towards uh, some kind of uh, understanding. Uh, years later, about 19... 83, 84, we had the first sexual abuse uh, checklists and uh, with such things as, you know, is the, is the child running away? Does the child have knowledge of uh, sexual, um, does she have knowledge uh, beyond her years or his years? Um, uh, is the child depressed? So they would have a number of characteristics that you might look through. And initially, workers uh, used this a lot 
and the, one of the problems that happened then was uh, sometimes workers were bringing cases, they tried to bring cases to court based on the risk assessment. But there was a number of cases that occurred then where um, their applications were turned down because uh, judges rightly said that, yes, you're showing me all these uh, possible risk factors, but you're not showing me any evidence, yeah, right? So uh, people had to uh, sort of back on, off on that, but uh, there, there's still risk assessment tools that are used today, but, uh, for, but a lot more uh, hopefully prudently. Uh, one of the things that happened is that uh, also in the 1980s with the advent of the Child and Family Services Act, <coughs> um, the level of proof um, seemed to uh, increase uh, with cases. Um, we uh, used to, um, first of all, uh, in the 70s, think that we could move towards um, there's a reason to believe uh, as a reason for go as a level of proof. And I, I, I think I called it the Rutherford, or I knew it as the Rutherford, but maybe the lawyers would know what I'm talking about there. I looked it, I looked it up in, the, uh, in Google. I couldn't find Rutherford. <laughs> but I know for sure that we called it the Rutherford level of, of, uh, of proof, reason to believe. And uh, with the advent of the Child and Family Services Act, there was a, great, uh, a lot greater emphasis on the, um, on the use of lawyers and there was a much more emphasis on uh, the balance of probabilities. And so um, uh, things really changed. There were lots of court workers uh, in the 70s who did a lot of the applications to, uh, to the court and what they presented in front of judges. There was a lot more um, viva voce uh, testimony by workers with the Child and Family Services Act that started to become more affidavits and a lot more formalized. I'm not saying this uh, was any more um, uh, difficult, um, but um, it really did change things a, a lot. So workers had to be really uh, sure of what they were bringing to court, uh, knowing there was a lot more um, oversight, uh, or they felt that oversight. So in regard to training on child sexual abuse specifically, and I'm fortunate enough to have kept all these books. Um, the old agency where I was, there's a room now, um, an archive room there where all these old training manuals and all those other things. So if you ever uh, talk to me about uh, that, and I can probably uh, refer you to that agency. They promised to keep them all there even though after I left. So, uh, so the first one was in uh, uh, the ministry training in 1982 by the government. Um, I've also mentioned before the Handbook on Child Sexual Abuse, the Nicholas Growth Book, Kathleen Kufeld, um, Sexual Offenses Report Canada, published in 1978, uh, recommended modifying the sexual offense provisions of the Canada Criminal Code. So even on other levels, uh, the response to, to uh, uh, sexual abuse uh, and sexual offenses was also changing. And one of the interesting things that happened uh, with the rise in the understanding of uh, child sexual abuse, there were different approaches being taken by agencies in regard to what do you do about it now that you're finding out that there is incest uh, in a number of the families. And uh, some agencies, um, and this is where agencies differed in different parts of the province, <coughs> but the area where I was from, um, there was a real rise in the expectation that agencies would then try to resolve the situation and where possible even try to uh, uh, have meetings between uh, the child and the parent who had a, a sexually abused, um, and to but, but to, to really um, take a focus on, okay, it's happened. Now what do we do about it? And uh, this actually, and I didn't realize it at the time, and only when I read uh, the Stalker report, which was uh, done in regard to uh, Cornwall's uh, sexual abuse inquiry. I think in about 210 or something, where they, uh, they looked at the possibility of a pedophilic ring, I think, in Cornwall. Uh, but there was a big inquiry, and uh, Carol Stalker, who was a professor at Laurier, uh, she actually wrote a report, and she refers back to the time here uh, in the 80s, uh, where some agencies really looked at the sexual abuse as being part of some family problem. And so you try to resolve the family dynamics, get, say, mom and dad, uh, 
you know, uh, relating on a, on a good, positive way, uh, try to protect the child, but also get the child to be able to talk to the, uh, the person who offended, to try to resolve some things on an emotional level. There are other agencies that didn't uh, do that. They had a strictly um, a child uh, safety focus and often the children taken away. But there were some agencies that really tried, if possible, to actually keep the child at home under some kind of safeguard, perhaps having a grandma or have s some other person there or even having the mother who was uh, non-offending to be able to uh, protect that child. So there was, there was still a, a flexibility. And apparently this went on, according to Carol Stalker, across Canada. And uh, there was a decision made um, at uh, some point by uh, the federal government, Canada's Commission on Sexual Offenses Against Children, um, to, to say that uh, agencies would uh, be better off to do a child-centered safety approach. But there was a real split in the field as to the responsibility to try to resolve it, especially in incest situations. Uh, some agencies as well, and uh, the one I was at, in, uh, at that time I was at Hamilton Catholic, we combined with uh, Hamilton CAS. Um, uh, I was a, a group leader, and uh, uh, a woman supervisor from Hamilton CAS um, um, was also co-leader, and we uh, had an uh, incest offenders group, and this was actually working right within the, uh, the agencies. And we used to have uh, people who had confessed to uh, sexually abusing their kids to be, uh, and who were uh, judged to be regressed rather than pedophilic, uh, we would have them in a group for up to maybe two years. So we didn't use a model of, uh, say, 10 sessions and you're out, like some of the domestic violence groups. We actually had them in there for up to two years. And uh, I have to say I found it uh, you know, gratifying to, uh, to work, um, very illuminating and also seeing the number of men themselves who've been sexually abused, which has always been one of the issues uh, for, for child welfare to kind of deal with, too, because you can have children who are sexually abused up to age 12, and, up to, and then at age 12, it now becomes a criminal offense, and then they sexually abuse somebody else when they're 14, and now they're uh, called a perpetrator. But three years before, they might have been sexually abused themselves. So there's always that kind of, um, it's, it's hard emotionally to, to put a place on it. So this uh, particular slide, I, I made the slides very detailed because I know it was the last uh, present presenter of the day. <laughs> so I'm kind of sailing through this so people can uh, get home. Um, disclosures of child sexual abuse, as you can imagine, um, really increased in the 1980s. Uh, and, uh, you know, with the more knowledge, people were more aware of what to look for. So it really um, started to uh, increase. <coughs> um, the key part that we uh, tried to emphasize with workers was that relationship was uh, huge, that the more you could try to relate to the kids as workers, uh, the more that they were likely to get a trusting relationship, just like some of the presenters have uh, mentioned here today um, and uh, it's, re it's really interesting that uh, when I look today um, what's happening in uh, ch uh, child sexual abuse investigations uh, there's a lot less uh, investigations taking place today than there were in the 80s and that's really disturbing to me and I think part of the reason today is that there's such an emphasis uh, after the year 2000 on prescriptive types of recording where the worker got, gets guided through step by step by step to deal with an initial allegation and then to decide at the end that, well, that allegation is true or it's not true. We either close the case or we keep it open or transfer it to family services. But there isn't that time being spent to be able to build relationships with kids uh, to be where, where they trust you enough to be able to tell you that they're being that they're being sexually abused, and I think that's one of the changes that was it was better in the 1980s in that regard, because there wasn't a, the recording was a little bit different and the expectations were different. Now it's so prescriptive, and you do this and you do this and do that, and then you close the case or keep it open or pass it over, but it it, it isn't getting to the emotional level of these kids. <coughs> 
And uh, one of the things, I, 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 uh, the child incident study, which is done by um, McGill and also the University of Toronto, every year they look at a number of uh, abuse investigations done by uh, Ontario's Children's Aids and others across Canada. But the, the number of sexual abuse investigations are decreasing. And um, it's, uh, it's only, um, say, 13% of the referrals to Children's Aids today involve actual abuse. And that's physical, emotional, and sexual. So it's a very small portion when you look at it. M most are just in the neglect category of, of the referrals. And, and I look at um, a study just being done last week that was published in France where they have a population of 60 million people. We have 40 million in Canada. And they, they were saying 160,000 kids under the age of 16 are being sexually abused every year. So we should at least have maybe 110,000 if you go by the same kind of stats. But we have nothing like that being um, referred or, or, or being disclosed. And I think that's something that we're going to have to worry about in the future. Uh, and I think there should be changes in the, in the ways workers are being told to relate to the kids and have it a lot more, just put it this way, have it less prescriptive so that workers can start where the client is and actually try to build the relationships and have a bit more time. In the 1980s, I don't have too much more, so I know, <laughs> but uh, in the 1980s was the first time we actually looked seriously at foster parents uh, uh, mistreating kids, and a lot of work was done by a person called Ross Dawson, who was also head of the Institute for Prevention of Child Abuse, uh, headquartered here in Toronto, and uh, so workers were now being um, really told, be, you know, just look out with foster parents. Many are good foster parents, but there are still some that are using the opportunity to abuse kids. So he, he really made that a prominent uh, uh, finding. I've mentioned a bit of this, uh, the first curriculum. And for those who have the slides, you can see the details of, of what was expected, nature and extent of child sexual abuse, self-awareness of the management, recognizing family sexual abuse of children, et cetera, characteristics of sexual abuse. So. This is a, something expected by workers. They were supposed to go to ministry training. They were supposed to have a big brown uh, book, which had, uh, I think it was volume seven, and th they were supposed to uh, keep that uh, as part of their uh, personal library at work. And then for the first time in uh, the, the Child and Family Services Act, you actually had sexual abuse being identified as one of the reasons for abuse. And there are some of the provisions of uh, CFSA 37.2, which give you, which, which identify that sexually molested or sexually exploited. There's also a provision in there that if somebody was allowing, if a caretaker was allowing a child to be abused, then that was also something that could be investigated or could open that child up to future uh, abuse. That was also something that could be investigated. Uh, also in uh, CFSA in 1984 was the rights of the child, no corporal punishment. So believe it or not, before that, uh, corporal punishment could be used, uh, of course, as a kind, judicious parent in uh, foster homes before that. But now it was no, cor no corporal punishment is allowed after uh, 1984. And also a number of other rights, no locking up, the rights to visit uh, the parents, to receive mail, private visits to participate in a plan of care, right to be heard, right to be informed. These weren't rights that were instilled by government before. Obviously, some governments uh, being a little bit more um, advanced, perhaps put it that way, might have uh, had those kind of principles. But each agency also had a policy manual. Um, and uh, before there were ministry directives, each agency was also expected to have policies on all these different areas. And this also emphasized identifying a caregiver's responsibility to protect the child by supervising the child to prevent the child from experiencing abuse. And then amendments to the criminal code. Um, testimony of children for the first time, right, could be uh, with uh, uh, Bill C-15, 
that it, uh, in some, and under some conditions, uh, the testimony of a child could be heard. Before that, that wasn't a possibility. <coughs> and uh, so that uh, didn't uh, say that all children, um, their testimony could be um, t uh, taken, uh, not as hearsay, but it, but, uh, it did give uh, some openings. And then you have uh, a Khan in 1990, which is a, a really good one. I think people are familiar with. And then uh, there was a, a few things uh, regarding sexual abuse that I think put the system backwards uh, in the 1990s, and that was the um, uh, false claims, app apparently. Like there was, I think it's called the Martindale, Martindale, the one in the Saskatchewan <laughs> where a, ch um, um, a child care center was accused of having uh, extensive uh, sexual abuse against the kids. And there was also in Hamilton, much closer to home, um, uh, um, thoughts that there was a large um, conspiracy of devil worship where they were sexually abusing kids. And I think both of those uh, were ultimately uh, disproved <coughs> after, long, uh, sexual, uh, after long trials. And uh, I think that threw things backwards a bit in, in regard to uh, the, the validity that children would have w when they testified. Uh, I was part of this committee in 1992 uh, uh, when we uh, revamped the, uh, the child abuse uh, standards and for the first time uh, you could look at historical abuse. So you could have somebody who was 18 and uh, you, as a children's aid society you could open the case up and you would advise them to go to the police, you would advise them certain um, you know, other community resources uh, and also if there were any children uh, say if the, it was the oldest daughter and she was 18, well, now you had a, a right now to go and look to see whether the younger siblings were also being abused. And this is the sexual abuse training in the 1990s. A lot more coordination uh, with the police. In fact, uh, the, the police college in Elmer uh, had a, um, a program combined with um, First of all, the Institute Prevention of Child Abuse, and then later on with the OACAS, which is the organization that oversees uh, children's aid societies in the province. And so there was a curriculum, uh, and for the first time, and I think it was the most important part of the curriculum, on the last day, all the workers had to uh, have a uh, interview um, where uh, actually they went to schools, and uh, um, all the parents had given permission but they would go, they would go to uh, schools and um, there would have been something happened in the classroom, maybe a clown came into the room or something. And what happened is um, the uh, police officer and a worker would actually interview the kids to find out what it was that, that happened in that room. And, uh, and then it was also videotaped. And I can tell you when you're being videotaped, um, it makes it a lot more difficult um, because you don't want to look stupid, right? And um, I think it was also intimidating uh, for some of the CAS workers because uh, I think the police were seen at a higher level of expertise in, in, in some of the regards. So I think there was an extra um, pressure on people. But I think going through that was so important. And that program ended in about 2003. The police college said it didn't quite meet their criteria of how they wanted to train their officers. Uh, so now uh, some of that training only takes place ad hoc between individual CASs uh, and individual police departments. Uh, the OECAS does have a training uh, course, but it is not um, held that often. I'm not quite sure. I think maybe funding or different issues. So not every worker today, even though there are training programs, is being trained. Um, my own thoughts are no matter what department you're in, whether it's in foster care, child care, kin homes or whatever it is, or investigation, family services, you should be uh, having intensive sexual abuse training. And I think that's part of the reason why the number of disclosures are not being found. Is that it? Yeah, oh, three minutes. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> this is just particular child welfare training uh, that, I, that I've indicated already, talked about. Um, things changed in the last 20 years. 
partly as a result of a series of inquests in 1998. Uh, the recording changed, the emphasis changed uh, in child welfare. A lot more kids came into care, but not necessarily for um, uh, sexual abuse. They came into care because of neglect, because for the first time it was a lot more prescriptive on, w on what uh, uh, neglect meant in terms of the uh, Child and Family Services Act at that time. There was a lot of criteria, and the number of children in care in the province of Ontario jumped, and many of those were Indigenous kids, uh, jumped from about 7,000 to 8,000 <coughs> kids to 17,000 within about five or six years. And a lot of that's neglect, and as you can imagine, with the living conditions of some of the Indigenous uh, kids on, uh, on reserve especially, um, it made them a lot more vulnerable for, for kids coming into care, whether they were being um, uh, serviced by an Indigenous agency or not. So it was, uh, it's a, it was a really difficult time. The, uh, about 2006-2007, uh, I was part of a group back in government. We tried to revise a lot of things, uh, become a lot more social work. Uh, kin service came into effect, another uh, differential response. Um, but these things have not really um, been maintained to the degree we had hoped from 2008, 2007. So here we are today. Um, I think my main point here I wanted to say is that in many ways uh, workers are a lot more skilled in some respects. So well, they have more knowledge um, of what needs to be done whether they can actually do it in real life through practice, I'm not quite so sure. Um, and I think we're uh, just the fact that we're not building the same relationships with kids. Uh, and, when I, and when I say that, I also mean with uh, with the non um, non abusing uh, spouse, for example. You know, if um, we got to build relationships with. Uh, with a mom or a dad, so we can find out. I, I you know, don't want to be sexist in one way or other, but uh, we're not building relationships with moms to, to the degree, you know, to help them because most of the situations we get in child welfare are um, people struggling with poverty. Um, you know, they're, they're not having all the social determinants of health, and we should be providing help. Um, uh, to people building relationships, not just with the kids, but also with the families. And, I, I'm, and that's how we're going to find out whether there's domestic violence. That's how we're going to find out whether there's uh, something that the mom is worried about, about the way dad is acting towards, you know, my daughter. You know, we're, we're not doing that to the degree. I mean, there are great workers who instinctively do this kind of thing, but it's not being reinforced, uh, in my opinion, um, systems-wide. So I'm sorry I raced through all that, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you.